I will run into the helpers of my destiny in the name of Jesus. You never get to where you want to go. No, 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 no. I shall achieve. I will be a wonder unto many in the name of Jesus. And today we're going to be looking at Jesus the Restorer. That's why we read Psalm 23, verse number 3. He restored my soul. Our shepherd, he is a restorer. And so I want you to connect with it this morning that whatever is that needs restoration in your life, I want you to hold your faith up and trust him. He will restore it one more time. So today, today I'm going to zero down on a topic I call total restoration. Come on, say total let me hear you loud and clear. Total. You know, the church is not a symmetry. The church in church we talk, isn't it? In symmetry we are quiet. See, this is, uh, we have a silence for the dead. But in the church, it is the assembly of the living. So I say total. Come on, say total. total. See, confession brings possession. What you confess, you can possess. Come on, declare with me total restoration. Coming upon my life. In the name of Jesus. Today and next Sunday, I'm going to talk about two individuals who were robbed. One man was robbed of his sanity. Another man was robbed of his life. Today, I want to show you that the world is full of people who have been robbed. Some opportunities were taken. Some people's joy were, were removed. Some people's peace and health were taken away forcefully. Some of you hearing this word this morning, you've been robbed. Some destinies have been robbed and derailed. Some valuable things in your life have been taken away. I'm talking to real people this morning, the God of restoration, it will come your way today in Jesus' name. And I look at the word restoration, what does it mean? It says to bring, uh, it's, it's an act of restoring. An act of renewal, revival, or reestablishment. And the very second one makes it interesting for me. It says, a return of something to a formal, original, normal, and unimpaired condition. The way it was originally. Whatever it is that the enemy took from your life, I pray today God will cause a restoration to come back upon you. You used to be a wealthy person, but suddenly you begin to struggle. Money is not flowing anymore. I'm asking God of restoration. He will bring money back to your life. You know, some people, they just tell the story of the year, yesteryears. Oh, uh, it used to be good, you know, in the years past. I'm praying that God will remove that word from your mouth. You will be in the current, in the living, in the now. That God is doing good things right now in my life. Do not just be telling story how it used to be good, how it used to be sweet. Restoration. It says to bring things back to its original state, how it was in the beginning. Turn with me to Joel chapter 2 verse 25. I want to give you this promise from the Old Testament. And it is a sure word for everyone who believe. God spoke up in verse number 25. Joel chapter 2 verse 25. He says, and I will restore. What does it mean? I will repay. I will give you back. I will restore back to you the years that the locust had eaten. The canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm and my great army which I sent among you. And I will restore. It is our prayer this morning and for the rest of this week, I want to ask you and I want to challenge you as we go to another week. I want this thought to be in your mind. We're going to send it to you by email. We want everyone to be focused on what the Holy Spirit is sent to us every week. We will not leave it alone until we see the manifestation. When God says, I will restore, you can count on it, it will restore. So wherever you go this week, I want to begin to look out for it. God says he will restore. They took your job, he can restore it. They took that position from you, he can get you, get it back for you. I want your mind to walk around it that God says I will restore. So I'm going to be looking for it. 
Let it reoccur in your prayer. God says, I will restore what the canker worm, what the palmer worm, what the locust took out of your life. I will restore unto you. If something is broken in your life today, if you are, uh, you, you're, something in your life is messed up, I want to say to you this morning, you are in the right place with the porter of life. Jesus, in, in the scripture, Jeremiah chapter, I believe chapter 10, it says, you are the clay, I am the porter. So if something is broken in your life, I can restore it. Something is removed from your life, I can, I can assemble it again. You remember the Dumpy, Dumpy, Dumpty Stumpy or whatever it's called? Anybody remember that? Say the, 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 something of the king broke, right? And uh, nobody can put it back together. But the creator will put you back together. I say he will put you back together. Whatever is broken in your life, he is the potter. If he needs to crush the, the clay and start all over again, he can do it, can he not? And you are in the right place this morning because I say to you, church is not a museum of for good people. You know that? But church is a hospital for those who are broken. People thought, well, when you go to church, it's a perfect place. What do you see in the laundry? All clean clothes? Come on, are you surprised when you get to laundry and you see some clothes that are dirty? Why are you angry? Say, what are dirty clothes doing here in the laundry? What is the laundry? Is it not a place where we can clean stuff? The church is a place where God visits us to bring back our life that is broken. I want to say this morning you are in the right place and God will reassemble your life again. He has the original formula. He never lost it. What the physician cannot put together, God can put it back. They couldn't find your DNA. Your genome is confusing. Your genome is, I mean, your DNA is different. They say you have one unique stuff, one in, in 10,000. But the original formula is in the hand of the Almighty God. It can put you back one more time. We're talking about a God of restoration. He says, I will restore what the canker worm, the caterpillar, the locust, and the palmer worm took from your life. And I was asking God, what are these locusts? I want you to look into your, in your note now. I'm going to be talking about some five things that God promised he will restore. During the week, the Holy Spirit was quickening this in my spirit. And I've been asking God to restore these five things in your life. What are these locusts and this canker worm? You can look at it on the screen. What are these? I call them the devourers. Locust means devourer. If you ever seen a field where a locust or, or a swarm of locusts invade in a matter of hours, everything is destroyed. If you ever had a counter with locusts, they are very, very destructive. They will eat up everything on their path. In a matter of moment, they devour everything. I said this morning, your caterpillar, your canker worm, they are devourers that are devouring your finances. Number two, they are thieves that are stealing from your life. Number three, locusts. What are they? They are things I call a waste. Things that is wasting your time and your opportunity. I'm talking to real people this morning. Maybe there's a locust, there's grasshopper, caterpillar in your business. You will identify them and the Holy Spirit will reveal them and expose them. The locust and the canker worm, they are the unproductive years of our lives. You work so hard, but you don't get much result. You sweat, but your, your sweat and your reward, they are not commensurate. You work too hard for what you are making. Those are the activities of locusts and caterpillars and palmer worms. All of the stages. You know, before it becomes locusts, it starts with the, the caterpillar, it becomes the, or the palmer worm. All of the stages, they all manifest themselves. But God of restoration, he will restore one more time in Jesus' name. Question is, how do the locusts get into our life? How the locusts got in? I need to open your eyes to it. We're not just praying because the locusts will come back if you don't know how they got in. Number one, they came in because you were careless. Many times our carelessness, we opened the door to the locusts and they invaded our lives. It could be through your disobedience. You were not listening. You were not following the instruction. You allowed the locusts to invade your business. They took over some things from your life. 
keep that on the, on the screen for the people. It could also be through our mistakes, some of the mistakes we make in life. Some careless mistake. You know, some people, some, some say mistakes, you, you can just with a backspace of a computer, you can cancel it. But some mistake cannot be backspaced. Is that right? You cannot just read it, delete, delete. It won't delete. So mistake anger around your life for the rest of your life. Is that true? I'm praying for the Holy Spirit just quickening me. Those who are professionals, any mistake that will destroy your career, you will not make that mistake in Jesus' name. So mistakes are waiting to happen. They are waiting to happen. You just told you were the, the nurse or, or the physician on duty when that mistake happened. I declare this morning, it will, you will not be around that situation in the name of Jesus. Some mistake can cost people their lives. Someone said the mistake of, of a dentist is pulled. The mistake of a physician is dead. The mistake of a pharmacist overdose. <laughs> you will not make mistake. Mistakes or mistakes are very costly. They, they change the course of your life. Even after God forgave you, the mistake is still in front of you. Amen. Low cost comes in to our mistakes. Number three, how do locusts invade our life? Through our weakness. Our spiritual weakness. When we tell lies. When we could not live right, when we compromise our faith. Think about Abraham. They say, Is this your sister or your wife? They say, Oh, she's my she's my sister. A moment of weakness and what belonged to him was taken away. Sometimes in our lives we were careless. Sometimes because we were spiritually weak, we're not fired up in the in the in the in the spirit. The enemy came in in the moment of weakness, it took your valuable. Scripture says no one can enter into the house of a strong man except you first bind him. See, if you are not strong enough, the enemy will bind you and take away your valuables. Locust, palmer worm, canker worm. I'm praying this morning, shut the door that is opening, that is open to the locust in your life. You want that? We pray and pray. After every deliverance, the locust come back again. Because the door in your house is opened. It could be your wife that opened it or some husband who opened the door. You don't pay tithe. Your wife is faithful. Your children are faithful. You do not. Man, you are opening the door. You open the door and the virus come into the house and begin to, to, to mess with everybody. It is time to shut the door. Every area of disobedience in your life, say, Lord, help me today. Let the door be closed. Because if the door is not closed, the enemy will have access. God asked Job, say, have you noticed my servant Job, how he's a great man on her? And Job and Satan said, well, it's because there's a hedge around about him. I couldn't get in. See, the hedge is so strong. I want you to, the hedge over your family, let it be strong. That no matter what the devil throws at you, it will not touch your life. Let the hedge be strong. He that, the Bible says, he that uh, dig a pit shall fall into it. He that breaketh an edge, what will happen? A serpent shall bite him. Let's close up all the gaps so that locusts and cankerworm and palmerworm don't get into our business. Praise the Lord. And it also could be by oppressive force, what I call oppression. Some forces just want to take stuff from your life. And that's why we got to be vigilant. The scripture watch and pray. Be vigilant because you have an adversary. It's called the devil. He's roaming around looking for something to steal from people. Is looking for somebody who is not paying attention. Is looking for somebody who is distracted. He will steal stuff from you. Say, so be alert, be vigilant, be in the spirit, be sober, be in control of your thinking faculty because there is an enemy. You didn't call for him, he declared himself your enemy. You know, there are enemies we didn't invite into our life, they just came. Nobody wants an enemy. You didn't write him a letter, but they show up at your door. Scripture says it's looking for something to devour out of your life. I call that an oppressive force that wants to steal from our lives. Five things God is going to do in this service this morning. I'm going to give them to you one by one and very quickly. Look at your note. It says God can heal whatever is broken. Do you agree with that? 
Are you there? You look, we're looking at our notes now. God can heal whatever is broken. He can replace whatever is lost. He can renew whatever is faded. He can restore whatever is stolen. I don't know which department or category you're falling. It faded. It got lost. It was stolen. It was broken. You know, various, use every time. God, Jehovah, restorer, he will restore. He will restore marriages. He will restore families. He will restore the, pro, the, the, the prodigal sons. Children that walked away. Do they need restoration? I want you to think of everything in your life that is not just working right. God says, I will restore. He will restore in Jesus' name. Number one, God is, Jesus is the restorer of life. And health. I'm going to show you in the scripture some five areas where Jesus restored things to people's life. Restorer of life. Restorer of health. We saw the story of a man called Lazarus. Lazarus was uh, sick one time. You see, the family was very close to Jesus. So the Bible says when Lazarus was sick, the, 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 the sister sent to Jesus, Jesus, please come quickly. Your friend is sick and he needs divine intervention. And the scripture says Jesus delayed. And he said, don't worry about it. The sickness is not unto death. Four days after, the master showed up at the door. And by that time, it was too late. Everybody, he met them in a funeral. They were all sad and sorrowful. See, it was too late for Lazarus because the man died. Four days ago, he died. And by the time, of course, when he died, they pulled him together. The master was not forthcoming. The creator of the universe was too late. May I say to you this morning, it will never be too late in your story. No, he will arrive on the time when that miracle is needed. And those, they said, Jesus, by now it's too late. We already put him away. It's, in fact, we've, we've rolled a stone around him. By this time, it's already stinking. You're too late. Four days behind schedule. The chapter is closed. And uh, it is over for him. Nothing can be done for him anymore. But the Lord said, not so. I will reopen the case. I said, this morning, the Lord will reopen that case for you. They said, no, forget it. It cannot happen anymore. And think about that. His brain has shrinked. His heart has stopped. The blood vessels have collapsed. Blood has dried in his body. Kidneys have packed up. Every organ has started decaying. What can you think about it? Master, you are too late. But the Christians say, I will restore. Did he restore? Yes, he will. He will. I say he will again. No, don't let whatever they say to, to tell you, don't that make you give up your faith. The, the physician does not have the final say. You remember we say the physician can give you the diagnosis, but only God can give you the prognosis. He has the final say. Yeah, there is fact, but there is also the truth. What they told you in the hospital, what the x-ray saw was, fa what was fact. But the truth is in the hand of the master. The fact was, Lazarus he was dead. Think about it. He was everything in his body has shut down. In fact, four days too late, man, he is already smelling. That was a fact. Is that not true? It's a fact. But Jesus said, I am the life, the truth, and the resurrection. If anyone will believe in me, even though he's dead, he can live again. So he has the truth. They said the womb is shut down. It's packed. There can be no baby in this womb. But the truth says, I am the life and the restoration. I will restore that womb one more time. Don't give up on yourself. Don't, don't call it quitting faith. Mary, Martha, they said, Master, we, we love you. We believe you. Maybe in the day of restoration. Jesus said, I will restore him now. Men may have closed the life story of your, I mean, your, your life story. Family and friends have given up on you. They said you are a hopeless situation. But I want to say to you today, God can restore. Write that in your note. There are a few things you need to do so that you can experience the miracle of restoration of life. Number one, you've got to be patient and trust him. 
write that down and show that on the screen, folks, over there. You got to be patient. You got to trust him. Because if you are not patient, you will waste the miracle. Be patient. He is doing something about your life. Be patient. You went to the barber's salon. The barber decided to start cutting it from the back of the head. It doesn't look right for you. You say, what are you doing, man? I want you to leave him alone. He will do a good job for you. If you are not patient, you will mess it up. Is that true? You go to the operating table, they put you on the, or the physician put you on the, on the table, and they brought a long night. They say, oh my God. Thank God they knock you off so that you will not participate in the operation. <laughs> Do you understand that? Because if you are participating in it, you will be yelling, you will be crying, oh my, that life is too long, I don't want that knife, oh, too much blood. What they're going to have, oh, you're going to have a mess in the hand of the physician. You may be dead after, so they knock you off. <laughs> so you are not involved. Be patient. He's doing something in your life. You may not understand. There is a reason behind every delay. The glory will be mighty. Yeah. <laughs> I said the glory will be better. Yeah. You will not just be a celebrated village, I mean, village celebration. It will be a city celebration. Yeah. Jesus held on for a reason. And he came four days too late. But I say to you, he may appear late in your life, but be patient and do what? Trust. He know what he's doing. All the doors you know, they shut down. All the promises they gave you, it didn't work. And then you lose it. Say, you know what? I don't even know what God is doing about my life. I'm just tired. How will go find me another God? Be patient. And do what? Trust. Trust is hard, isn't it? Especially when you are confused. When you cannot see where you are going. Have you ever been in GPS? The GPS lost you. Turn right, turn left. Then you find yourself. There's no road here. If your GPS is working, it will find you a road, isn't it? Even if your GPS is not working, I'm talking about divine GPS. It will always find a road for you. But you've got to be patient. Some of us, after we feel frustrated, I've been there before, say, turn left, turn right, no, make a U-turn now, make, I just turn it off. Well, I'm on my own now. You just, out of anger, you turn it off. And then the thing stops talking to you. And then you get lost even more. Can you trust the divine GPS? It's calculating. And you always hear the word recalculating. Even when you make a mistake, heaven is recalculating. <laughs> oh my God. I see somebody say, oh my God, everything around me is a mess. I made a mistake. But I hear heaven say recalculating. You miss that woman, but heaven is calculating another woman. Some young men have asked me, what if I miss the person I really, really supposed to marry and that person marry somebody else? That would be a lot of confusion. I say, don't worry, leave God alone. He is recalculating. Amen. Amen. Do you believe God will, he will restore stuff into your life? He is a faithful God. So number one is you got to trust and you're going to be patient with him. It is not too late. Then we notice something that Jesus said after they complained and said, look, look at John chapter 11, verse 38, verse 38. Jesus, therefore, groaning again in himself, come to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, take ye away the stone. Look at the instruction. If you're going to get the miracle of restoration, write it down in your note. Roll the stone away. There are stones that will prevent the miracle. Roll it away. What are those stones? Stone of unbelief. Stone of self-pity. Stone of self-blaming. Blaming yourself. Stone of regret. Oh my God. Had I known if it were not this, no stoppage. Roll the stone away, the stone of unforgiveness, the stone of bitterness. You have to let it go so that heaven can release your blessing. Your Lazarus is inside the cave and he will hear the voice of the Son of God. But roll away the stone first. The Lord won't do something that we can do ourselves, isn't it? Why didn't Jesus go roll the stone himself? He said, no, you, that is your responsibility. My responsibility is to give you life. It's your responsibility to take away the stone. If you must take this miracle, you need to start greeting that brother. You need to start. I know you don't feel like greeting him. No, no, I do not. Don't 
don't want to greet. Start greeting him. It is a stone that will block your Lazarus from coming out. The miracle is real, but the stone is also real. Jesus said, roll the stone away because a miracle is about to happen. Roll it away. Some stones, I call them the stone of excuse. I am too old. It is too late. Who says it is too late? 50 years plus and you are school of nursing. Who says it is too late? Ah, we have a miracle here in this church, isn't it? And it's practicing right now. 50 plus, he is practicing. Who says you cannot do it? It is a stone that is holding you back. You roll it away. See, I'm too old. I don't want to be, you know, the younger people be messing me up. I mean, think about me. They were in their diapers when I was in college. But see, that is how life brings it. Now you are in the United States. Humble yourself. Sit in the class and roll away the stone. Say, teach me what I don't know, bro. Because there is a miracle still in life, in your life. You may look old, but you are not old. And who, who, who defines old anyway? <laughs> the, the word old is only your maker can define old. I've seen parents who live like 110. Even their son who lived 75 died before them. If you had things like that, <laughs> mama is still around. Say, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> we heard about a woman who was 90 something years old who went to take a degree. It's you that is defining whole. You are the one who thought you are old. Who said you are? If you have money, you are 75, you can marry a 20-year-old girl. <laughs> I didn't say you should do that. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, old, no, don't give up on yourself. Don't call it quit because it's a stone that is holding back your miracle. I don't have the right color of the skin. I don't know people. I don't have a college degree. We know what I call that stone. Roll it away. Turn to verse 43. John chapter 11. What else must you do? Verse 43. And when he had thus spoken, Jesus, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot, with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto him, unto them, loose him and let him go. Look at what Jesus did concerning that miracle. He did not call Lazarus as a corpse. He called him by name. Until you begin to call the dead thing in your life by their proper name, they will not be released. Every thought Lazarus was a corpse. Jesus said, no, he is living. Lazarus, he called him by name. How can a, a dead thing hear you? When you are speaking and confessing your faith. Number three, right there. Confess and declare what.